So ever since I first learned about myosin and actin, there was always this kind of uh, thought that popped in my head, a kind of an analogy, if you will. And for a long time, I thought this analogy was pretty much spot on. But then I, I gave it some more thought, and I realized that I was wrong. And so I'm going to share with you what my analogy had always been. And you'll see, I'm sure, pretty quickly why I was mistaken. So let me start out by just drawing out the actin and myosin. This is, of course, in red, the actin. And in purple, I've got my myosin. This will be my myosin here. And this is, of course, uh, three different... Uh, myosin and actins I'm going to draw for you. I'm going to show different stages of how they could look. This one is a little bit more stretched out here. And I'll draw like that. And the final one will be very, very stretched out. We'll actually just kind of get almost off this screen, something like this. So these are my three actins and myosins. And we know if we were to actually take a step back, maybe I could even label them A, B, C. Let's call this one A. Let's call this one B and the third one will be C. So we've got our A, B, and C. And you know there's this kind of uh, helpful way of looking at this stuff. We call it the tension length curve. So I'll put tension over here. And this is, of course, kind of a unit of force, thinking about how forcefully something is contracting. And then over here, let me actually erase that. Over here we have sarcomere length, right? So these are our two axes. And on the on the uh, graph, we can quickly just kind of put where A, B, and C would lie. So you can see that based on the way that I've drawn the stretch, I'm just going to kind of divide this in half. Based on the way I've drawn it out, A is actually going to have almost no force, right? That's going to be the, the conclusion we can reach. It's going to be something like this. And then B will be somewhere up here. Let's draw B right here because there's going to be a lot of force there. And C will be, I'll draw it right here at the edge. Also, almost no force. And you remember that this actually falls on a kind of curve that we drew out before, something like this, where actually I didn't draw all the points here, but it kind of goes like that. So this is our tension length curve, and you can see where A, B, and C kind of fit on that curve. Now on the side, what I wanted to draw on the other side, I'm going to draw out kind of what my analogy used to be, the way I used to think about it. And it also kind of breaks down into an A, B, C, and I'll just write it out here. And it's something that I always used to play with as a kid. I always used to love slingshots. And so I'm going to draw three slingshots, one, two, three. And each one will actually have a rubber band attached to it. And I'm going to stretch it out to different lengths. So let's say this first one I kind of don't stretch much at all. And then this second one I stretch really far, as far as I can. And then this third one, I stretch it so far that it kind of snaps. And of course, if I have a slingshot, I need a stone. So I'm going to put my purple stone right there, and I'll put my purple stone right there at the tip. And then this purple stone, I guess I have to kind of hold it, because otherwise it would just fall down, right? So what would happen if I actually now tried to plot out on this side, on the uh, right side of your screen, if I plot it out similar to kind of the tension length, but in this case I would put, instead of tension, let's put distance. And this would be like the distance traveled of my stone. So maybe I can rewrite this and make it a little bit more roomy. So distance of my stone traveled, and that'll be here. And then I can also, on the x-axis, I can put something like uh, how much I stretched my rubber band. I'll just put, um, let's say, stretch. And, and you'll know that that means how much I stretched out the rubber band on my slingshot. Now, if I actually let go of all three, the stone would probably fall right there on A, and it would fall right there on C. But for B, it would kind of launch, right? It would launch away. And so in terms of distance, I can actually kind of plot that out. I could say, well, you know, for A, I had almost no, you know, uh, distance. I would say zero distance, you know. And for C, kind of the same thing. I would say really no distance. But for B, I had a lot of distance. So I actually did really well with B. And this is kind of how I always thought about the heart. I always thought, well, you know, it's very similar in some ways to a slingshot. You know, you have kind of an up and a down, right? And so I always kind of walked around with that idea. But I gave it some more thought recently, and I was thinking, you know, is this really accurate? And I think the answer uh, is no. And let me show you why. So on the slingshot side, let's do this side first. What, what do we have exactly? We have elastic energy, elastic energy, and that's just the elastic in the band. But there is energy stored up there because it's a sort of potential energy. 
it's actually very similar to what happens in our arteries where you store up energy in our uh, elastic large arteries like the aorta. But you have this elastic energy and when you let go of the stone, what basically happens is that you convert all that to kinetic energy, right? So you're converting it all to kinetic energy, mo energy of movement. And when you let go of that stone, it happens automatically. So you, you really don't have to put energy into it because you already had elastic energy. It was already stored up. So in that sense, we often think of this process, and this is actually kind of the important part, we often think of this process as being passive. So you often see the word passive. Put that down here, passive. And that simply means that we didn't have to add any energy, but specifically the kind of energy we're talking about is chemical energy. So when people say there's a passive process, usually in biology what we're talking about is not having to use chemical energy. And of course in the slingshot example, there was no chemical energy used. But in my heart example, in my sarcomere, there was chemical energy. In fact, what we're really doing is we're converting chemical energy and specifically the type of chemical energy we're talking about, if you remember, is ATP. Remember all those myosin heads are working and grinding through ATP. So this is really ATP energy that we're burning through and we're creating again kinetic energy. Sometimes I call it mechanical energy, but both times what I mean with kinetic or mechanical energy is to say that you basically have the heart pumping. You actually have movement of the heart and the way that you're getting it is by burning through all this ATP. So in that sense, because we're burning ATP, oftentimes in biology we call this kind of an active process. Now in both cases, you're just changing one form of energy to another. So it's not like I was completely wrong with my thought process. I mean, it was there are some strong similarities, and at the end of the day, both of them are creating movement. So there is a similarity there. You're changing energy forms and you're creating movement. But the key difference is in what type of energy we're starting with. And I want to make sure it's very, very clear that with the heart, it often looks like a rubber band. It even kind of sometimes feels like it could be like a rubber band where you're stretching out. But really never forget that the myosins are grinding through ATP and that that is the way that you're actually able to create the kinetic energy. Whereas in an elastic band, you're actually using elastic energy. So that's the key difference.